Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. 30 years ago on October 11th, 1994, BronxNet at the time, the Bronx's one year old cable network, debuted the borough's first ever TV talk show, Bronx Talk, this program. Now known as the borough's flagship talk show for 30 years, I've hosted more than 1,460 programs that have included more than 90 political debates, hundreds of programs on education, healthcare, the environment, development, crime and policing, arts and culture, and just about everything and anything you can think of about the Bronx. Tonight, we're thrilled to celebrate our 30th anniversary of this program, and we are honored that Borough President Vanessa Gibson has joined us to help commemorate this occasion and also to chat about a bunch of things in our home borough of the Bronx. Good evening to the borough's 14th borough president, the Honorable Vanessa Gibson. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you. Happy 30th. Yes, it's a, <laughs> we're, I have some fun things before we get to the, okay. the real business. So this is the first thing. This is a book I put together of a list of every show that we've ever done. It's 114 <laughs> pages long, and you can you pick any date. Education test stores, comic books, debate, politics, people with disabilities, politics, Pelham Parkway trees, wow. Bronx books, <laughs> Mary Mitchell Community Center, borough president that time it was Ruben, politics, Carl Hasty, mm -hmm. a torture forum, housing, and you can go to any page. Isn't that crazy? That's wonderful. 114 wow. pages. <laughs> and of course, on the last page is the 30th anniversary oh, borough. Nice. The next thing that. is. I have this is a list of all of your appearances <laughs> on the show. You are prepared. Right, well, <laughs> I'm prepared every night, right? That's what we do. So this is a list which I'm going to give to you. Every appearance okay. you made, you were on, you've been on the show 24 times. Wonderful. Thank you. 24 okay. times. <laughs> And I, I actually did the same with um, your predecessor, Ruben Diaz, mm -hmm. and he was like, wow. I wow. Isn't that amazing? What, what was the amazing. first one? Then? The first was the debate for the 16th oh. Council District in August of 2013. There you go. <laughs> and then you were on for you were on our 20th anniversary, which yes. we did at right 2014. So while mm -hmm. while you look at that, we took out a clip from that episode on the 20th anniversary. So it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, here's me interviewing at that time. I guess you were a council member at that time. You had been elected to the city council. It was uh, 10 years ago, October mm -hmm. uh, 2014. Let's take a look. Ms. Gibson, now let's yes. see. You, you were only well, on new. twice, or oh, four <laughs> times, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, I guess, for a debate that you were on. It was mm -hmm. the first time that you right. were on. Um, what was that experience like, being in a debate? Uh, and Because you were... Be you were an assembly person looking to run for city council. Right. It was very interesting. Um, being in the assembly for four years and then becoming a candidate last year running for the city council was really just an opportunity for me to serve my constituents on a local level using a lot of the experience I gained in Albany, um, dealing with a lot of policy matters before New York State, and really now applying it to the city council. So it was a very interesting and spirited debate. Well, you know, I have, I, 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 I'm going to give you a little inside baseball because I usually, you know, I'm, I'm take a very objective stand during the debates. But I felt very sympathetic for you because, and we're going to show this clip of somebody asking you a question that uh, frankly didn't make sense. I and mean, basically he, was, he wasn't aware of what the process was and then he was accusing you of not supporting women's rights, which right. would seem to be a conflict. Right. Did you walk away saying, what was he talking about? So a lot of times I'm really not surprised at times, and what I always say to anyone running for elective office, whether it's city, state, or federal, is to really learn and understand the process. And so in this particular debate, in that segment, the question was about the Women's Equality Act before Albany that was pushed by Governor Cuomo. And I was one of the supporters um, working with my colleagues in the caucus and to support And he basically it. accused you of not supporting it. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, you can't control everything, I suppose. Mm. <laughs> All right, there you go. Yes. I, I appreciate that the borough president got it's, it's like yes. looking at home Know movies. the process, yeah. yes. So then the last thing I have, I have a gift for you. Okay. A lot of people don't know that in 2004, so that would have been 20 years ago, mm -hmm. we put out a CD 
of oh, called Bronx, Bronx music. music we, volume one, we never put out a volume two. But these were all the artists who had performed on Bronx Talk over the years prior to that date. So I guess it was 10 years to that point. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so there's people like Dave Valentine and Willie Colon, mm -hmm. Africa Bambata is on here. There's an original track called The Sound of the Bronx which I always thought could have been a hit record, and they <laughs> mention all our neighborhoods and all that. There's probably a box of these under, in a basement somewhere. Okay. I found five or six of them in my closet, and it's my gift to the borough oh, president of the Bronx. Oh, thank you. And Bronx when, music. When, when you put, oh, and, and yeah. we should notice that, and you guys could put that back up on the screen, that is an art piece of artwork done by Tat's crew. Oh, we love Tat's crew. They're great. They, they, there's the picture. Yes. Doo-wop, hip-hop, salsa. There you go. Mm -hmm. And then on the back, you can see all the groups that had been on it. Uh, <laughs> you put it on shuffle, and I'm telling you, that first song, uh, the one, The Sound of the Bronx, you're going to love it. So there you go. That's my gift to you, Madam Barbara. Do we President. still have CD players? Oh. <laughs> you, if you want, I can send you an electronic version of it. <laughs> But at least you have, at least you have, yeah, that, was, that was, she, she is the bow president. That was a great answer. Are you, do you wow. have a way to play it or I'll, I'll get you the electric, well, I'll get you, I'll get you digital <laughs> copies of it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there it is, Bronx music, and these are, you know, the groups are on. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's, uh, let's have a, a okay. the real conversation sure. that yes. we always have. Yes, yes, yes. Um, what, what? When you wake up in the morning, aside from taking care of yourself, what are the things, that, the big things that you think about? This is what we've got to do here in the Bronx. This is what my larger agenda. Of course, you've got a million things to do. So what's on your mind about the borough of the Bronx, the health of it, the difficulties, mm -hmm. etc.? So usually when I wake up, I am confirming my schedule for the day. I am praying that nothing happens out of the ordinary, nothing unexpected because you usually do expect things that may come up. Uh, I am also always thinking about the larger agenda of our administration when it comes to some of the larger capital, whether it's the Metro North expansion, the work at Orchard Beach, down in the South Bronx, and the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. We wait, 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 have to hold on. So we list, <laughs> those are the big projects. Those are the big ones, The yes. big ones, yes, and, yes. and you want to make sure whatever has been planned is, Correct. of course, being enacted. That's right. And, that, and so that, You've got various check marks. Mm, if right, necessary, you'll, you'll, mm -hmm. Now, do you do that with your staff, or do you call out to, like, Orchard Beach folks or whatever, or does your staff handle it? So usually we talk to the staff internally first, my planning and development team, my comms team, and then we figure out if an update is needed based on the information we have. Usually we get inquiries from media, or I do ask the BP or News 12, and people will ask, well, what's happening at the Armory? What's going on? And so based on a lot of that, we will reach out to the relevant of an agency uh, and ask for an update. Uh, th things that are difficult, things that you look at now and say, gee, we could really got to get, aside from the development and other things, we got to get this addressed. And I'm sure there are many of them, but what's at the top of your mind? Public safety is always a priority because I think it's something that we've come a long way in the area of gun violence and domestic gender-based violence. We still have far too much violence when teenagers are victims, when parents are, you know, burying their children. It's not acceptable. Domestic violence, the recognition month of October, we're raising awareness around that. But I think for me, public safety is probably the biggest because it's constantly a conversation that's evolving. Working with NYPD, working with law enforcement, working with other agencies, anti-gun violence organizations, crisis management system. How can we look at the root causes of violence? Why young people engage in violence in the first place? What are some of the choices and options they have? Pathways to college and careers, more rec centers. All of that we constantly think about because it's relative to budget and policy. And so that's ongoing. Um, that's probably the biggest challenge because let, I think let, we've made let, great let's progress. Let's stay with that for a okay, second because sure. hearing you talk about it, and we could go look at the list because mm -hmm. you were the chair of the yes, uh, I, public, I safety. public safety. Public mm safety. -hmm. I didn't know it was policing and crime <laughs> of the public safety committee. So you've always been tuned into that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you uh, joined the NYPD recently to announce funding for public safety initiatives. Yes. So this was an example of you knowing this is a problem. And uh, let's say you put up state of the art security cameras in a mobile command van. Uh, an allocation of nearly four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars for the cameras, et cetera. Um, just talk about that process and what it takes to get from zero to making that. Absolutely. Happen. So earlier this year, when we had our state of the borough in March, 
we outlined our blueprint for the borough and we talked about major capital we talked about economic development creating jobs lowering the unemployment rate and really focusing on the issues that matter one of which is public safety and I knew at that time I wanted to do something more and I know that lighting and cameras are a part of public safety it's not the only answer but a part of the conversation so I committed that I would do something for NYPD because many residents will say we need a camera in this area we need a camera here what's going on the mobile unit we only have one in the borough and it's at, really? at the borough level wow. so we wanted to do more so that was something that we committed to and when the June budget came and we have our allocation we put in $395,000. So we were able to join NYPD, our borough commander, the district attorney, Darcel Clark, and school safety, RTG, SOS, Guns Down Life Up, all of our anti-gun violence organizations, and we made an announcement at Borough Hall several weeks ago. You um, mentioned here, and of course uh, we've had this dialogue, especially when you were the chair of the Public mm -hmm. Safety Committee, uh, about the real roots and the real roots of making sure our kids are occupied and right. uh, have after school things. So you were enthusiastic about the adoption of the New York City budget, which yes. relates to all those things. Yes. You said it reverses many of the budget cuts that the mayor had previously announced to critical programs and places the city on firmer financial footing moving forward in all of the things that you talked about, arts and culture, education, housing, mm -hmm. all of these right. go into crime. Talk a little bit about the budget maybe how it compares to, to previous budgets when you are in the city council, uh, uh, you know, and, and of course, how does it affect the Bronx? Right, so over my eight years of serving as a council member of District 16, we never thought we would face the global pandemic known as COVID-19. And that really set us back as a city when it came to our financial stability. We were in the red, we had a deficit, we were not getting a lot of support. We had less revenue coming in from property owners and businesses because essentially the city shut down and we had to make really tough decisions. That was around the momentum when defund the NYPD came about because it was with the understanding that we could shave a portion of NYPD's budget and focus on education and parks and culture and all the programs that really took a bigger hit than NYPD. And so fast forward, understanding working with the Adams administration, I think the budgets have been better. But earlier this year when the prelim came out, I was very concerned, like the city council, that parks were at stake. Park workers who are DC 37, library services. We lost three libraries in the Bronx with six day a week service. That's not acceptable. That's not good. And we fought, we advocated, we added our name to a lot of letters, uh, making sure that the city council and our Bronx delegation would really champion these issues. So the adopted budget that we ultimately did see was far better than it was proposed. Uh, there were some cuts, I acknowledge that. But for the Bronx, my goal was to make sure that we maintain school services, after school program, recreation, not-for-profits were supported, parks, playgrounds, cultural institutions, libraries. So a lot of that was not only restored, Gary, but some of the money was baseline, which is a big deal, because that means we don't have to return next year to fight for that money. It has been baseline. You know, o over the years, um, we, we have talked about all of uh, these things, and I'm, I'm curious because we've talked about how uh, the borough president, they say it's really ceremonial, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cheerleader, you're, you're cheerleader <laughs> you're, which you are, um, and you don't have a vote. Is it frustrating that you don't have a vote or do you like the leadership role that you can say to the people who do have a vote, this is what we got to do? I accept my role as borough president, but I do miss being a part of the budget process. Really? I was on the budget negotiating team under Speaker Corey Johnson. I was in leadership. So I had a real intimate role in crafting the budget for the city council. Uh, when it came to council initiatives, adding more money for domestic violence programs, for education, for cleanup, sanitation services, I was at the table. I do miss that because we were able to really invest a lot of money in programs that really make a difference. On that list, and of course in the history of your work in uh, the borough of the Bronx is the Drome Avenue rezoning. Yes. And I recall when it came out, you were not thrilled. You, did, you were very <laughs> diplomatic about it, but we did a couple of shows and you and um, I think it was at that time council member uh, Fernando Cabrera yes, worked mm -hmm. together. We did mm -hmm. a show in the other studio uh, about what was going and you were able to craft it in a way that made it acceptable. I think yes. you got schools. Yes, and I did. 
See, I've been around a long mm -hmm. time. We've been working on this together. Um, what I thought about in relation to that was the Bronx Metro North Area Plan, mm -hmm. and that it came out, there were issues about it. Um, talk about that plan. Um, you uh, put out a statement. You said it will bring transformative changes to mm -hmm. the East Bronx landmark, called it a landmark uh, initiative, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you're, you're pleased with what turns out, and uh, do you have still, I guess there's always concerns, but talk, talk about that plan and uh, where it's at right now. Right. Well, no plan is ever perfect. I think it, it starts in one place, it ends at another. My recognition to the city council, specifically to the council members that represent the East Bronx corridors that are going to see four new Metro North stations with access to Penn Station. This is a $3 billion investment in the Bronx. When it comes to jobs, economic development, MWBE support, when it comes to construction and permanent jobs, we are seeing stations in Co-op City, Section 5, in Hunts Point, down in the South Bronx, Morris Park, as well as the Parkchester Van Ness community. And specifically, Morris Park and Parkchester are getting housing. Several thousand new units of housing, 1,900 of which will be permanently affordable. In neighborhoods that have not always done their fair share when it comes to raising density, when it comes to more residential options. This is really a game changer because it does allow options. If we want to get commuters out of vehicles, we have to offer them something better. The Metro North is a better option because it reduces our carbon emissions, it reduces traffic on our streets, and it's really about choice. And I understand not everyone will use the Metro North, but the benefits that we get are tremendous. We're getting new schools, we're getting $170 million in infrastructure, over $500 million in capital, recreation center, new schools that has been committed. Majority Leader Amanda Farias and Councilmember Marmorado, Councilmember Salamanca, and Councilmember Riley really led these conversations. We had visioning sessions in the community. We talked to people about what they wanted to see. And at the end of the day, Gary, we are adding value to incredible neighborhoods that really can absorb more. And we're really trying to look at equity. This is about transportation and really what I call an equity and a justice issue. We, uh, one of the things that is very interesting because you didn't lead with, we're, we're dealing with a transportation desert, which really is the bottom line. That's but right. this really was a much larger thing. Mm -hmm. We had DCP here, mm -hmm. and, and we talked about what the options were. And unlike many of the things that many of us have seen for 30 years uh, or for longer, um, I had the sense they were really ready to listen, as well as the team of council members um, which is real, was really a diverse team in terms of diverse neighborhoods and everything yes, else. That's right. And, and uh, so congratulations on it. Um, and, and obviously when you wake up in the morning, you're going to call and say, hey, how is that going? <laughs> we want to make sure it's moving forward. It, it leads right into a discussion of City of Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Which one? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how Economic you Economic opportunities or housing. <laughs> well, um, you, do you urge the council to vote on it yet? Or can it be amended before it's, uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the um, Department of City Planning approved it. Where, where are you at as far as the City of Yes? So on both the City of Yes for Economic Opportunities, which happened first, my recommendation was Yes with Conditions as well as the City of Yes for housing opportunities. I think there are many components of City of Yes that could work for the Bronx. Remember, it's a citywide plan. The Bronx is very unique. It gives more latitude for homeowners that want to expand along their property uh, with accessibility, uh, accessory dwelling units. But it also expands, I think, areas that are low density and it adds a little bit more height uh, and square footage to allow for more access for residential opportunities for housing, which we need. We're in a crisis right now, and the Bronx will be a part of that growth. Uh, I think there are some components that we have major issues with, like removing the mandate on parking is a big problem. I was problem. hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> I heard it from the community boards, and getting it through 12 community boards was not easy. And all of them went through the public review process, and ultimately some made recommendations of yes, others voted no, and I understand. So we had to look at all of that in totality and make our recommendations. And I typically, if I support something, I usually vote yes with conditions, and my conditions are very extensive. So I give them anywhere from 10 to 20 pages of recommendations on what I believe you, you are did enhancing. With this, with this Absolutely, project. yes we did. And, and so um, <laughs> do you, I, I'm, I'm not sure of the process. So 
Um, can the council modify the plan? So, so that's what you would recommend to uh, yes. our Bronx delegation. Right. All of our that. recommendations go to CPC uh, and then as well as the city council. And anytime it's adopted, it's because of changes that the city council makes. That's what happened in economic opportunities. And that's the same that will happen for housing. I was a little surprised, a different topic here. I was a little surprised about this um, study that came out. Transportation Alternatives worked with the NASA Develop Environmental Justice Team. They did a study that found that hot bus stops oh. are, I know that you're <laughs> right. And I was like, wait a minute, what, what are we talking about? And of course they found, I mean, this is, we've heard this in so many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, they're more likely to be the hottest bus stops in New York City located in black, Latino, Asian, yep, and high right. poverty community, mm -hmm. it, communities in Queens, and uh, of course the Bronx. You called for expanded tree canopy coverage yes, I did. in community boards one through six. T talk about this. It, it one of those things in the Bronx that flies under the radar. Nobody knew about this, and we did a show on it, and then I saw that the borough president took it very seriously. What are your concerns, and what are the solutions? What, what do we do? We have to do more when it comes to canopy coverage. We looked across 12 community boards, and we saw that many of our boards were far below the citywide of 22% of canopy coverage. The city council canopy passed- Canopy meaning trees. Meaning trees. Or even, even bus shelters. Correct, including that's, bus that's shelters. That's what they look like. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The city council passed legislation that was codified during this term that is calling on the city of New York to move from 22% citywide to 30% by 2030. What that means is we need more bus shelters and we need more trees. We have to plant more trees. So I joined my four borough presidents. I, I'm, excuse me, I'm right. only shaking my head because of course, of course we live we in an trees. urban place. Trees give yes. life, I mean. That's okay, right. I'm sorry, I just couldn't. So I joined my four borough presidents, including Staten Island, and we all supported the additional million tree initiative that started under the Bloomberg administration. And we believe that we can make it a better partnership this time around because we have to work in concert with clergy, CBOs, with schools, with other organizations that actually may want a tree in front of their business. We have to work with NYCHA. We have to work with parks, all of our city agencies. So we did a press conference to shed light on this with BCEQ, with South Bronx Unite, with uh, Loving the Bronx, uh, and Waste Management down in the South Bronx and CB1. Some of our community boards, Gary, are less than 10% of canopy coverage like CB1 I in saw my haven. I, I was just That's looking at those acceptable. numbers. That's not acceptable. So we want to do more, we can do more. And yes, if you look across community boards one through six, it's mostly concentrated in areas uh, with communities of color. We're talking about street trees, like on, on sidewalks that they'll put little uh, yes. plant. That's, but that can what, grow into like well, really of adult course, trees. Of course. <laughs> we, we, um, what, one last thing I really want to talk about, um, because um, drug use is nationwide, mm -hmm. it's an international yes, problem. It is. However, you just announced this week, I know you know very well, $6 million allocated for a new facility to combat opioid crisis in the Bronx, tripling treatment capacity. Talk about what we've had and what we're getting, if you would. We have had a crisis with opioid overdose deaths. Last year, we led the city of New York with 831 opioid-related overdose deaths. 831 people, loved ones, family members, and friends that died because of this crisis. It is a call to action and attention, and I think it has to shed light on the existence of preventative measures, drug treatment programs, and harm reduction programs. Many organizations like St. Anne's Corner Harm Reduction, 30 plus years in the South Bronx doing this work. Everybody's been doing it 30 years. Right. <laughs> Samaritan, Daytop, Bronx, Bronx. a lot of organizations. So what we did was we have been working closely with Lincoln Hospital as one of our major trauma hospitals in the Bronx and in New York City. And we learned about this opioid recovery and bridge clinic proposal that Lincoln had a $6 million cost to build out their sixth floor at the main building to centralize all of their existing programs because right now you have clients going to different locations. And in order to reduce uh, just a lot of gaps in the service, we want clients to come to one location and get a myriad of wraparound services. So we work with Speaker of the Assembly, Carl Hasty, and the local Assembly member, Amanda Septimo, and we're able to collectively come up with $6 million in both the state adopted and the city adopted budget. So we joined our new president at Lincoln, Christina Contreras, and our CEO at Health and Hospitals, Dr. Mitch Katz, and we announced a $6 million and, commitment. And that's where the Bronx Recovery Center yes, is Yes, it will be. be housed in Lincoln. We're almost out of time, um, 
what's new? What, what, what do we don't know yet that the vote president is thinking about and working on that's coming? Come on, it's we coming, wanna, it's we coming. We want to break news here. Well, it's a <laughs> Everybody in the studio is laughing. Maternal health care is a topic that we ah, always talk about. And you were on the show. I, I could show you what you were on show. the show. I have a show, yes. Right. So I am coming out with a birthing report in the next few weeks, and it's going to highlight the urgency and the need for a birthing center to return to the Bronx. We had one back in 1988 with Morris Heights Health Center, and it closed. We don't have one now. There are only three birthing centers in New York State, two in Brooklyn and one in Buffalo, none in the Bronx. My goodness. We're going to get one because we're going to invest in birth workers, doulas and midwives, prenatal and postnatal care because black and Latino women are nine times more likely to die because of pregnancy-related complications. You know, I once asked Amanda Farias, who is here, about what, what would the difference be in the city council if we had, and they eventually got a women's majority. Yes. This is what happens when we have a woman borough president. Thank you so much. Thank you. You are the fifth borough president to be on the show. Let's see, we had uh, Bob Abrams, Freddie Ferrer, of course, uh, uh, Adolfo oh, Carrion, Ruben Diaz Jr., and, and uh, uh, the Honorable uh, Vanessa Gibson. So thank you so thank much you. for being with us. Thank you for your enthusiasm about the Bronx. Absolutely. Being on the show, we counted yes, it 24. Yes, 24 this is our times. 24th appearance. I'll get and, more. Um, uh, we appreciate it. So I think we're ready. Uh, we're going to celebrate our, fourth, uh, our 30th anniversary. Okay, Here we it's go. not a cake with 30 well, there, candles. We, we have, not with 30, with three and of course, okay. it's a Bronx cake from S and S oh. Cheesecake, and I'm gonna let my wife Suzanne come on the set. Happy 30th Ooh. anniversary, Happy 30th Bronx Nat. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Wow. We've got flowers for Gary. Oh, look at that. Here we go. 30 years. 30 years. years. And yes. Let's say Suzanne has been watching me get ready yes. for every one of those 30 yes. shows. You said I was prepared. She knows I prepared. Beautiful. Every day. Um, are we ready to blow out the candle? We're going to blow out the blow candles? Out. Should we get Michael Max to come up here? Michael Max, who's the executive director of Bronx okay. Net? Well, we have a new way, Michael, of blowing out candles, you know, in a post-COVID world, right? I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, so we go like this. I'm we don't Michael blow. I, I had no idea. Yeah, we use paper and cardboard. Well, we, we, okay, but we can still make the same good wishes for yes. the people of the Bronx. And we wish Bronx Net another successful yes. 30 years. There we go. I don't know if I'll still be here for that, but here we go. All right. Ready? ready? One, two, three. There we go. See? All right. Post COVID now, world. <laughs> now we will, we will cut this. It's healthy. Cake. Listen, we have way too many people uh, to thank on this special occasion. <laughs> of course, thanks to the Bowl President for joining us and gracing us with her presence and her knowledge and yeah. her enthusiasm for the Bronx. Thanks to, uh, he's here, BronxNet Executive Director Michael Bronx Max Robbie. We've had a number of producers over the years, and so we thank them all, <laughs> of course, to our current producer, who's Rebecca Hemmick. She's not here today, but Stephen Powell is here filling in for her on this program. Director Will Guzman, editor Yessi Diaz. Uh, we have a, th a crew of a thousand who've worked with us over the years in the studio, but really, most of you, the people of the Bronx, who have made our hometown the incredible place that it is. Next week, another show, 1465. Another show. We'll talk about media, local media, and New York City news media in light of the closing of WCBS 888 Radio. So, if the curtain don't fall and the creek don't rise, yep, we'll be there. We'll see you next week. Happy 30th. Woo.